Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. All right, our speaker tonight is the president of Catholic Answers. Christopher Check served for seven years as a field artillery officer in the Marine Corps, after which he served for 19 years as vice president of the Rockford Institute. In 2012, he joined Catholic Answers as director of development, and he was named president in 2015. Please join me in welcoming back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Christopher Check. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, better, you better hang on to that until, I, you know. Oh my goodness, I'm so happy to, I'm very happy to be back with the Institute for Catholic Culture. Um, of course, sub, excuse me, Father Hezekiah is, uh, is out on the West Coast with me, though he's way north of where I am, nine hours north, um, up in uh, the Sacramento area, I think. But I'm going to see him on um, the 14th, we're meeting in San Jose. So I'm looking forward to helping Sabatino, excuse me, Father Hezekiah, <laughs> um, do something like this out on the out out out, out on the, out on the West Coast, folks. You, I, I'll tell you, I travel a great deal uh, more than I wish. I just came from the airport, and w so forgive my, I didn't put a tie on. Well, actually, that's a lie. Since I moved to California, I don't even know where my ties are. Um, but it gave me an excuse not to put a tie on. The part about just coming from the airport is true. Uh, but uh, but th there is not, a, a, you've heard me say this, there's not another program like the Institute for Catholic Culture in any other diocese in the United States. If there is, I don't know of it. There may be. There may be some things that approximate it. But, but, but this program of adult formation, adult catechesis, uh, adult education spread across so many parishes, spread across so many disciplines, theology, philosophy, literature, history, liturgy, art. There's not anything else like this. This is, outside of dispensing the sacraments, the most important thing going on in the Arlington Diocese, Archdiocese. Is it Archdiocese? Yeah, yeah it is. Diocese. And by the way, by the way, you should be saying thank yous right now for your, your new ordinary. Amen. Yeah. Um, so support the work. Completely run on donations. It's extraordinary. Right? Please support the work that this fantastic crew is doing. On the morning of 14 November 1921, a man dressed in coveralls carried a bouquet of roses down the nave of the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City and laid the flowers at the foot of the miraculous image. As he walked away, dynamite he had concealed among the flowers exploded, rocking the basilica shattering the marble steps of the chancel, destroying the iron candlesticks, and bending over backwards the large bronze crucifix that stood in front of the image. The tilma was unharmed. Indeed, although windows in houses as far as a kilometer away were shattered, not even the glass covering the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe was scratched. The young man's name was Luciano Perez Carpio. He seems to have been an employee of the Secretariat of the Presidency of Mexico, and there's reason to believe that the President 
a man named Alvaro Obregón, who had lost his right arm serving as a general in the Mexican Revolution, had himself called for the bombing. The evidence? The Basilica at the time had an unusual number of soldiers milling about disguised as civilians. They apprehended the bomber, shielding him from the Catholic mob that would have torn him to pieces, and took him to safety in an army truck. At his trial, the prosecutor, a man named Eduardo Neri, pressed no charges and declared that the event had benefited the Basilica because now even more ignorant pilgrims would come to venerate the image and the Catholic clergy could fleece the faithful for more donations. For all of his bitter cynicism, Neri was right. To this day, the bent crucifix and, of course, the unharmed tilma can be viewed at the Basilica by the 20 million or so pilgrims who take their intentions to what is the most visited Catholic shrine in the world. According to one source, 20 million a year. The next closest would be 7 million at St. Peter's in Rome, 6 million in Lourdes, and 5 million at Fatima. The story of the failed attempt to destroy the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is one of an astounding catalog of phenomena, events, mysteries, and startling new revelations in the history of the conversion of Mexico. In the United States, we have become accustomed to seeing the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on air fresheners hanging from rearview mirrors, on candles in the grocery store, even on tattoos, that we are at risk of becoming inured to the extraordinary and singularity of the story of the conversion of Mexico. If there is a story in salvation history, the incarnation accepted, that stands so apart from all the others, I don't know it. And I believe that the Catholic faithful need to devote more time to contemplating this story and wondering, perhaps, if it is even finished. I do not think it is. But we're getting ahead. I'll propose three reasons, doubtless there are others, why the story of the conversion of Mexico is altogether unique in salvation history. The first is the collision and eventual unification of two utterly at-odds civilizations pagan Mexico, and Christian Spain. The words pagan and Christian are insufficient to describe the divide. The collision between Mexico and Spain in the early 16th century is a collision between the diabolical and the divine. The second is the person of Hernán Cortés. It has long since not been in favor to praise Cortez. I do not care. He is first among the conquistadores. He is a man of extraordinary courage, vision, and drive at least equal to that of Christopher Columbus, another figure, by the way, that we're not supposed to praise. Cortez is an historical figure who could stand alongside Alexander the Great. It is hard to overstate his qualities or his impact on the history of the Americas. Was he a flawed man? Yes. Was he afflicted with lust for gold? Yes. And for women? Yes. Was he an instrument of the divine in the transformation of Mexico in Christ? Yes. Was he deeply devoted to the cross? Yes. Was he deeply devoted to Our Lady? Yes. 
The third reason that I would say this event of the conversion of Mexico stands apart from all others like it in salvation history are the apparitions of Tepeyac Hill and the subsequent and rapid baptism of millions of Mexican natives and the mysteries still being revealed of the tilma that she left as a gift to all the people of the Americas. So, first, pagan Mexico and Catholic Spain. Who were the Aztecs? What do we know about them? Aztec is a name that historians have assigned to the people of Mesoamerica's greatest empire, probably not the largest empire. The Mayans, I think, were probably larger, but certainly the Aztecs were the greatest empire. But they would have called themselves Mexica, hence Mexico, or Tenochca. The name Aztec derives from Aztlan, the mythical island home of the ancestors of the Aztecs. Scholars debate whether Aztlan was in northern, what, what is now northern Mexico or what is now the southwestern United States, or if it even existed. But the anthropological record shows, along with the codices from Sp the Spanish colonial period, show a migration of these people from the arid lands of northern Mexico to the fertile basin of central Mexico. What, what are codices, by the way, or what, what is a codex? These are ancient pictograph manuscripts, usually with sheets folded on top of each other. There are quite a few of them that survive from the colonial period. There are a handful at best that survive from the pre-colonial period. But here's some examples. In fact, this one's unusual because it's not in color. Most of the Aztec codices were in color. Here's, here's an image of them leaving their island of Aztlan. Here's another one. Uh, of, of, the, of the discovery of uh, Tenochtitlan, their, their city, uh, where they see the eagle perched on the cactus growing out of the rock, right? Um, here's one more. This last one is a page from the Aztec calendar. 20 months of 18 days each with five left over. Uh, the Aztecs were extremely skilled astronomers. Some people have argued that they were more advanced astronomers uh, than their contemporaries in Europe. At least pre-Copernicus, that's probably an argument that could be made. Uh, but it shouldn't surprise us that pagans spend a lot of time looking at the sky. People who have not had the benefit of Revelation spend a tremendous amount of time looking up at the sky, energy, time, tracking, and seeking to make sense of the movement of the heavenly bodies. Has anybody ever been here? Does anybody know where this is? Chaco Canyon? It's in north. You, yeah, I recommend all of you go. It's in northwestern New Mexico, kind of midway between Farmington and Albuquerque. You need a, an off-road vehicle to get to it. Um, but these are Pueblo Indians. Uh, actually, Robert Redford has an, if you can find it, has an excellent documentary about Chaco Canyon. Um, my boys and I were out here uh, not so long ago. That's not my picture. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, th but, but, but this is a similar kind of thing. The, the, the ruins of Chaco have been now identified to, to have extraordinary precision in tracking the lunar and the, and the solar calendars. Um, so uh, we tend to think of uh, non-literate cultures as you know, ignorant or primitive or something just because they're an all culture. But these people were extraordinary astronomers too. So I'm getting off my topic a little bit, but this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Pagans spent a lot of time looking at the sky and were very good at it. The Aztecs were also accomplished mathematicians. They had a developed legal system. They were starting to develop a written language. They were skilled architects and engineers, right? All that stuff you heard in fifth and seventh grade or whatever. It's reasonable to describe Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan at the capital city built on the island in the middle of two lakes as an engineering marvel. Certainly the Spaniards, when they first beheld it, uh, were, were astounded. Uh, the, the Spaniards' first encounter with the people of the West Indies were the primitive people in Cuba and Hispaniola. And these people had absolutely no 
uh, stone buildings. They had no masonry whatsoever. So when they started to see, when Cortez and his men begin to see, as they're moving closer and closer into the center of Mexico, more and more elaborate buildings, they realize they're, they're dealing with um, an, an, an intelligent culture. Uh, so, Tenochtitlan, stone buildings, elaborately laid out cities, broad paved boulevards, urban gardens, and steam baths. The Aztecs were r- real enthusiasts for hygiene. They probably bathed more than the Spaniards did. We don't want to overstate the quality of their architecture. They didn't have a column like the Greeks, so we don't see anything like Greek temples, right? Uh, they didn't have an arch like the Romans. Right. Comparisons of Tenochtitlan to Venice seem a little overstated to me. There were no domes in Tenochtitlan, and the Aztecs did not have a wheel. By the way, they had no domesticated animals, right? Uh, not even dogs. <laughs> uh, they did not have any metallurgy. Uh, they did fashion gold and silver and copper into jewelry. So if you call that metallurgy, but they certainly didn't make, uh, there was no forging, there was no iron, uh, there were no alloys, and there was nothing like Toledo steel, right? The greatest swords ever in the history of swords. They did have obsidian knives used in war fighting, but used even more in human sacrifice. Many pagan peoples practiced human sacrifice, and cannibalism. The Aztecs practiced human sacrifice on a scale not found anywhere else in the history of mankind. No other people come close. Even the Carthaginians tossing those babies into the furnace of Baal, right? They, don't, they can't compete. They're bush league compared to the Aztecs. I, I, I'm going to steal from Warren Carroll because he's got a good description in his book. Every Aztec city and large town had a central square from which a high pyramidal temple rose and four gates opening upon four roads approaching the town in straight lines extending at least five miles each ending at one side of the temple pyramid. On each side of the temple pyramid was a steep stairway to the top. The whole structure was skillfully tapered inward suggesting even greater height than the 90 to 100 feet that was common Month after month, year after year, and temple after temple, the sacrificial victims came down the road to the steps, climbed up the steps to the platform at the top, and there were bent backward over large convex slabs of polished stone by a hook around the neck, wielded by a priest, with head and arms stained black, never cut black hair, caked and matted with dried blood, and once white garments soaked and stained with innumerable gouts of crimson. An immense knife with a blade of midnight black volcanic glass rose and fell, cutting the victim open. His heart was torn out while it was still beating, held up for all to see, while his ravaged body was kicked over the edge of the temple platform where it bounced and slithered in obscene contortions down the steps to the bottom a hundred feet below. Later, the limbs of the body were eaten. Yeah. This is that advanced civilization you heard about in fifth grade. How many victims annually is a matter of some debate? Probably 50,000 or more. There is one account of 80, 000, from 1487 of 80,000 sacrificed in over a period of four days. So just do the math nonstop, nonstop. That would be one every 15 seconds. Presiding over the demonic ritual was Tlacolel, the Grand Vizier, the architect of the Aztec Empire, the power behind the throne of the emperors. And I think that's sufficient on the Aztecs. Frankly, I have to tell you, in preparing for this talk uh, and reading about these rites, it's so unsettling. I just, I just put, had to put the material aside and, and go say some prayers. Um, Carol asserts, nowhere in human history has Satan so formalized his worship with so many of his own actual titles and symbols. Right? Snakes, for example. Right? Across the ocean were a very different people. No nation's history lends its well lends itself well to summary. The history of Spain is terribly tangled, although 
they intersect throughout history. The story of Aragon is not the story of Castile, neither are they the story of Al-Andalus. But in time and formally, under the great Catholic monarchs of Ferdinand and Isabella, it's the Spanish were united. And, and why? Well, for seven centuries, beginning in 711 AD, the Christians of the Iberian Peninsula, originally a land of Greeks and Romans and Visigoths, a couple of Roman emperors, right? Trajan, right? Constantine came from Spain, right? Originally a land of Greeks, Romans, Carthaginians, and Visigoths fought the longest war in history, the Reconquista, the Iberian Peninsula. It was during this seventh century war that Spain's understanding of herself as a crusading people, especially chosen by God, came into relief. Right? This is very important to understand the story of Cortes. A crusading people, especially and militantly, right, revealing this, this vocation. If we don't understand the significance of the Reconquista, we can't make sense of the conquest and eventual conversion of Mexico. Was it bloody? Yes, it was. Did it bring forth the most Catholic nation in the history of this hemisphere? Yes, it did. Reconquista Spain produced Hernán Cortés, a man of action and a man of devotion, both fierce. Let's talk a little bit about Hernán Cortés. Thinking about the story of Hernán Cortés really brings the poverty of our own age into relief. What do I mean here? Poverty, because we have such a high standard of living, all these wonderful material things that we can buy on Amazon.com, right? I am certain that many more insightful writers than I have already exposed the stupidity of a phrase that measures human success with the base barometer of material comfort. So what standard, after all? Yes, I know we live suffocated by the triumph of liberalism, cheap Chinese-made things that bleak and bleep and high def, supersized portions of bland, unhealthy food, instantly available, altogether mainstreamed pornography, sex denatured by the contraceptive pill, bad music, bad books, bad motion pictures. Engulfed in this enervating din of so many sights and sounds and surrounded by so much stuff, too many of us are deaf and blind to the poverty of our age. But look here. Our age does not produce men like Hernán Cortés. Our age offers no calls to greatness to compare with the conquest of a new world for cross and crown. Uh, I think the closest thing maybe that could come to compare would be the, the early space program, right? But actually, I think that's a trifle alongside discovering an undiscovered world, vanquishing the overwhelming and terrifying evil that held it in its death grip, and founding a new land that flourished for three centuries, informed and inspired by the gospel. Mexico, the most Christian country ever to grace this continent. This is the legacy of Hernán Cortés. It's nothing less than this. Moreover, he began the whole enterprise not with you know, state-of-the-art rocket ships, right, funded by ta taxpayer dollars, right, and the top engineers and mathematicians of the day, but instead... 508 Spanish soldiers, 109 sailors, 38 crossbows, 13 matchlocks, 14 cannons, and they were second-rate cannons. They weren't particularly good ones. 16 horses. Horses were still in short supply at this time in the New World, domesticated horses, right? And a handful of camp followers. Oh, and he paid for this expedition himself, right? Right? A fortune he built because he decided to leave the easy promise of a lawyer's life back in Spain and risk it all on the other side of the Atlantic. If your sons and daughters yet harbor any of what G.K. Chesterton calls the gift of wonder, or even if they don't, confiscate their screens and give them a copy of Bernal Diaz's It's On Your Sheet, The Discovery and Conquest of New Spain. I found this book late in life, alas, uh, my old friend Tom Fleming, for whom I used to work at the Rockford Institute, recommended it to me, and he was ex explaining the thrill he felt as a schoolboy reading the most extraordinary adventure since Odysseus takes the long road back 
to Penelope. Rome's daughter, or, or, or Aeneas, right? Leaving, burning Troy behind to find, uh, to found uh, the greatest civilization, Rome. Rome's daughter, Hispania, after seven centuries of fighting the enemies of Jesus Christ, and with abundant fervor, cultivated in history's longest war, emerged second in history only to her patria, only to Rome. And in the 16th century, she secured her greatness by doubling the size of the world. Spain forever changed modern history. So none of the nutty New England Puritans from whom some of you are descended or the virile Virginians from whom some of you are descended, you know, under John Smith, would have brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in, a, you know, religious intolerance. That's the, that's the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Or capital gain. That's Jamestown, right? Had it not been for Hernan Cortez who laid this foundation for civilization guided by providence and the desire to bring Christianity to the new world. Was not Cortez lured by the prospect of gold beyond imagining? Of course he was. Was he not an aggressive womanizer with a long line of children, natural and legitimate? Yes. Did he not spill much blood, some of it unjustly, throughout his conquest? Yes. We have all heard, as I say, in fifth or seventh grade, and insofar as we hear any of it today, right, how awful Cortez was. And to add to the old event, we, we brought cruelty, subjugation, smallpox to this unspoiled land, right, this bucolic land, and this masterpiece of city planning. Actually, there's one exception here that I, I found when I was looking through the, the, <laughs> the children's literature on this topic. I don't know how this got back. That, Pat, I, I, I don't know how this got past the censors at the scholastic press. You wouldn't want to be an Aztec sacrifice. Well, no kidding. <laughs> right. So I don't know what the inside of this book looks like and who, who in the world would show it to their fourth grader. But there is a, there is a sort of candor about this that's very charming. <laughs> the truth is, as we have seen in Mexico, as we have seen in Mexico under Aztec rule, uh, Mex Mexico was a wretched place to live. Perhaps the nicest thing we could say uh, w would be to compare the Aztecs to the Carthaginians. Carthage, uh, uh, although Carthage, along with brutally enslaving their neighbors, crucifying generals who failed on the battlefield toss toddlers into the fiery furnace. At least they knew how to mine tin, right? And they had a, had a Ford steel. They had a, a sophisticated uh, sailing uh, nautical trade, right? Where the Aztecs certainly outdid the Carthaginians was in the scale of their human sacrifice. Cannibalism, not in evidence in Carthage, was common in pre-European Mexico, and not just among the Aztecs, but among, among all the surrounding tribes who were subjugated by the Aztecs. Much is made of the Aztec Empire, Right? As Bishop Francis Kelly, I think his book is on their blood-drenched altars, he asserts, the foreign policy of the Aztecs was not to form a peaceful empire. The Aztec relationship with the neighboring tribes, unfortunate enough to suffer under their rule, was driven by the demonic desire for blood. The Spanish cruelty of which we hear so much did not call for a steady supply of victims for Aztec priests whose religious rites culminated in a still-beating heart to be torn from the living man, woman, or child out of the hole in the chest rent by a stone knife. The truth of the greatest conquistador's relationship with the natives is this. They welcomed Cortez's deliverance from the Aztecs. And yet today, there's a statue of Cor Cortez in Spain that was recently vandalized. This is how he is regarded by the children of Hispania today. A man, by the way, with great, as I say, with great devotion to Our Lady. All right, here are the principal events. After working briefly as a notary in Hispaniola, Cortez joined in 1511 Diego Velasquez in his conquest in Cuba. For the next decade, he accumulated land and wealth, sometimes quarreling and sometimes cooperating with Governor Velasquez. You all have seen relationships like this. There's the guy on top 
who's gotten kind of fat and lazy and comfortable, and then there's the fellow underneath who sees the power vacuum, and, and he feels called to fill that vacuum. And, and the way he does it isn't always necessarily above board. But that, that's a quick description of the relationship between Velasquez and Cortez. In short, Cuba wasn't big enough for both of them. At the age of 34, a young man, Cortez led his expedition to the mainland in defiance of the governor. He, he, he just takes the ships and leaves. He lands at the Yucatan. He makes his way up the coast. He defeats an army. He defeats an army of Tabasco Indians. And this is where he meets his famous mistress uh, and translator, the clever and beautiful Nawa woman, Malinali or La Malinche, a word that survives today in Mexican slang to mean, uh, regrettably, to describe a traitor. But the reality is this woman wasn't a traitor at all. She had been sold off by her Aztec stepfather who didn't care for her to one of these neighboring tribes that then Cortez encounters and they give La Melinche to him as a gift. She's very much... Sacagawea Saca doesn't have anything on La Melinche, how important she is to the story, f functioning as Cortez's counsel and translator. And, yeah, lover. They had a child the first mestizo child. Founding Veracruz on Good Friday, Cortez claimed Mexico for our Lord and for the Spanish crown. All of Cortez's rhetoric, and you see it all in his, in his correspondence, he, you know, he uses, under, he borrows from Constantine, under this sign we will conquer. Constantly talking about they're there to spread the cross. Declared himself its ruler, answerable only to Charles V. There would be no retreat. Right, you've all heard the story about how he how he burned his ships. He didn't really burn them; he scuttled them. Right, he ran he, he ran them aground. He kept all the hardware and all the rigging and all the sails. However, all right, so it was plain we're marching inland to find the legendary Aztecs famous for their gold. The events of the arduous overland journey revealed the breadth of the conqueror's virtues, his capacity to inspire his men and extremists. By the way, a man with no military experience prior to this expedition. His brilliance at diplomacy in enlisting Indian tribes. I'm not going to fight him if I can get him on my side, right? And his skill at battlefield tactics and near reckless courage in the thick of the fight when diplomacy failed. Within four months... He had come within range of Tenochtitlan, but his reputation had arrived well before he got there. Montezuma sent several messages to Cortez saying, no need to come. You don't need to come here. Right? These missives the conquistador ignored, and when he showed up with his Spanish soldiers and tens of thousands of Tlaxcalteca, these are the principal allies, allies. The Aztec king, perhaps believing Cortez was the ancient god Quetzalcoatl, right? There was an Aztec prophecy, fair skinned, light hair, and arriving in the particular calendar year. So Montezuma has a fatalism, a, a sort of a, if you will, theological or spiritual fatalism about Cortez's arrival, even before he meets him. Or at least possibly, if not Quetzalcoatl, at least possibly his messenger. Received his conqueror with a kind of melancholic fatalism that led in time to his end. Montezuma and his people were advanced. Like I said, they bathed more frequently than the Spaniards. Here's sort of a Spanish drawing of Tenochtitlan. In the center of this marvelous floating city, the Spaniards came face to face with evil. And here where you read Bernal Diaz's, because he was with Cortez on the expedition. When you read Diaz, uh, it's terrifying. Your hair stands up. His description of the stench inside the Aztec pyramid top temple, the walls caked with the dried blood of tens of thousands of victims. It's terrifying to read. Imagine a few hundred, so we've got a few hundred Spaniards inside the city of how many hundreds of thousands, millions of Aztecs, right? Uneasily measuring their every move to prevent insurrection, ever imagining that any minute they're going to be on that stone altar. In a stroke of real daring, what does Cortez do? He takes Montezuma prisoner. And he might have proceeded peacefully with his conquest had not the jealous Velasquez, right, the governor of Cuba, who now is irritated at Cortez, and he sends an expedition after him. So sends an army after him. So Cortez, who has now, who has taken Tenochtitlan, now gathers 
his army to go meet Velasquez outside the city, right? Leaving the least garrison possible in the city, Cortez, badly outnumbered, marches out to meet the Cuban governor. The obese Velasquez, by the way, did not join the expedition. In a surprise night attack, very unusual, fighting at night. This also freaked out the Aztecs that the Spanish would fight at night. Defeated his fellow Spaniards with very few casualties and with his customary rhetoric of service to Jesus Christ and promise of untold wealth, he recruits all of Velasquez's soldiers now to his side. Good thing, because back in Tenochtitlan, while Cortez is fighting off Velasquez, under the command of the garrison, the Mexican garrison, excuse me, the Spanish garrison, under the command of Pedro de Alvarado, had provoked an Aztec rebellion with a massacre of some 600 noblemen. Here's a fact. There are three massacres in the story of the conquest of Mexico. Two of them are, uh, are, are, are perpetrated on the Aztecs by neighboring tribes, neighboring Mexican tribes, seeking revenge. So the Spanish aren't even involved. One is by the Spanish. It's not by Cortez. It's by Alvarado. Cortez returned to Tenochtitlan, now overwhelmed by unrest. Ushering Montezuma onto a balcony to address his people, Cortez hopes to quiet the uprising. Instead, the king of the Aztecs was stoned to death by his people. Aztec accounts say that the Spanish killed him. Who knows? And the Spaniards knew their lives hung in the balance. Leaving the garrison under the dark of night and rain and carrying as much gold as they could, the Spaniards and their native allies. You see, the city is connected to the mainland by these four or five or six causeways, right? So, they're now, they, so they're now they're going to escape the city and they're escaping off, off these narrow causeways to get back to the mainland. Discovered by Aztec warriors, they were surrounded in the hand-to-hand fighting that followed was b- brutal. The accounts uh, differ. Some 500 Spanish soldiers were lost in what has become to be called La Noche Trista, the night, triste, the night of sorrows. Captured Spanish soldiers lost their lives on the grisly altars of demonic worship. And the Aztecs thought they had rid their city of Cortez and his men for good. They did not know the depth of this man's resolve. After escaping to Nochtitlan, Cortez and the straggling remains of his army, they, which had lost all of their horses, all of their artillery, fought off the pursuing Aztecs in a battle of Otumba, during which Cortez killed the Aztec commander himself, causing the Aztec soldiers to flee. Catching his breath, Cortez asks, has Martin Lopez survived? Who was Martin Lopez? He was Cortez's master shipbuilder. When he heard the word yes, Cortez knew he would return to Tenochtitlan. Some 70 miles east or more in the town of Tlaxcala, so he returns to the town of his allies, Cortez set his army to the business of felling trees and building ships. But they didn't assemble them there. They carried the sections of the ships overland, as a builder might do today, you know, with a manufactured home, right? And then the soldiers assembled 13 warships on the edge of Lake Texcoco. Tenochtitlan fell at last in a brutal amphibious assault. Rah. Few of the legendary buildings survived the three-month siege, the final, decisive, most brutal battle of the conquest. Cortez the warrior conqueror now became Cortez the no less brilliant administrator, a role for which he is insufficiently celebrated, for he began the building of, a first, of the first truly Christian society, land in the New World. Was there slavery? Yes. In time, it gave way to vassalage and in time to abundant land ownership among the natives. Unlike in the Protestant United States, where our policy with the natives was what we called manifest destiny, which is a nice way of say, saying keep pushing the brown people towards the Pacific Ocean, right? Cortez's policy was convert, baptize, integrate, right? Intermarry. Did it work? It worked magnificently. 
Mexicans of Indian blood would paint pictures to rival those of European masters. They would master the tongue of Cicero and the philosophy of Aristotle. And they would one day teach both to the great-grandchildren of the conquistadores in the lecture halls of Mexico's magnificent universities. As we will see, Our Lady would use the Spanish to transform Mexico in Christ. As in, as in medieval Europe, the liturgical calendar and the sacraments leavened the activities of domestic and civil life. It's difficult for Americans where we live with the separation, this, fic- this fiction of the separation of church and state to understand the depth to which the faith penetrated human experience in Mexico. But if we try to imagine it, then we'll start begin to appreciate the legacy of Hernan Cortez. But of course, Cortez, like all of us, was an, in- an instrument in a providential plan. It would be wrong to state that in the wake of the conquest, a new Christian order suddenly descended on Mexico, vanquishing the demon worshippers was only the first step in the transformation of Mexico in Christ. And the way being cleared, it was time for the Holy Catholic Church to flower in the new world. Cortez himself had said to Montezuma, our Lord and King will send men who will lead holy lives, who lead holy lives better than ourselves, who will explain everything about the Christian faith. Our Lady would soon perfect what Cortez had begun, but first she called her priests, in this case, the sons of St. Francis, to begin to sow the land cleared and tilled by Cortez. Known as the Twelve Poor Men, a squad of Spanish and Flemish Franciscans, read by Fray Martin of Valencia, sailed from Mexico and walked barefoot from Veracruz to Mexico City. By the way, centuries later, Junipero Serra would do the same thing. The name of this band was given to them by the Indians who noted their poverty in contrast to the conquistadores. The work of building churches, learning languages, teaching catechisms, baptizing souls, and preaching sermons began. Here, here's here's an excerpt of one of the sermons. You have a God, you say, whose worship has been taught to you by your ancestors and your kings. Not so. You have a multitude of gods, each with his function, and what they demand of you and sacrifices your blood, your heart. Their images are loathsome. On the other hand, the true and universal God, our Lord, creator, and dispenser of being and life, as we have been telling you in our sermons, has a character different from that of your gods. He does not deceive. He does not. He hates no one, despises no one. There is nothing evil in him. He regards all wickedness with the great with the greatest horror, forbids and interdicts it, for he is perfectly good. He is the deep well of all good things. He is the essence of love, compassion, and mercy, and he showed his infinite mercy when he made himself man here on earth like us, humble and poor like us. He died for us and spilled his precious blood to redeem us and free us from the power of evil spirits. This true God is called Jesus Christ, true God and true man, dispenser of being in life, redeemer and savior of the world. But God writes straight with crooked lines, as the saying goes, and it is Cortez's insatiable drive that had served him so well during the conquest that would, alas, at this moment in the story, create a political chaos not conducive to the flowering of the Christian faith. Let's summarize. In 1524, Cortez sends a man named Cristobal de Olid with six ships and 400 men to conquer Honduras. Olid decides to set himself up there as absolute ruler. Cortez spends the next two years in an arduous overland journey expedition to Honduras to bring Olid to justice. And in so doing, he left a vacuum of authority in Mexico City that was filled by four unscrupulous governors who tried to seize control of Mexico and of Cortez's gold. The chaos devolved into a war on the Franciscans, who placed Mexico City in, under interdict. Freshly converted Indians were now scandalized by the behavior of the Spanish. Emperor Charles V hears about the problem. He makes a good decision and a bad decision. The good one is he appoints a priest named Father Juan de Zumaraga as Zumaraga as Bishop of Mexico. It would be his eyes that would first behold the tilma. The second was an audienza, or council, to govern Mexico. Zumaraga was a saint. These men were not. 
There followed a period of cruelty, a vast slave trade, including facial branding, um, abuse of native women, theft of gold, and abuse of the Franciscan priests, a couple of whom were tortured. The Audiencia censored all correspondence back from Spain. So there was no way for these Franciscans to report back to Spain what was going on in Cortez's absence. Zumarga conceals a report that he writes in a bacon slab in an oil barrel on a ship bound for Spain. Clever guy. Made aware that the conditions in Mexico had not improved with his political appointments, Charles V outlaws all slavery. He sacks the Audiencia, restores Cortez's captain general, and Zumarga, he gave the additional title of protector of all the Indians. Now is the time for divine intervention. Even with order restored, the Indians could not help but feel that they were the subjects of a foreign power and a foreign religion. Quatlatua, talking eagle, would have been 13 years old and only a few miles away when the Temple Mayor in Tenochtitlan was consecrated with the 80,000 victims in 1487. After the Spanish conquest, he was baptized, Juan Diego, and his wife, Maria Lucia. Lucia. She died in 1529. Two years later, on Saturday morning, December 9, the day after the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, was walking from Tuputlac, where he lived with his uncle, he was caring for his uncle who was sick, Juan Bernardino. He was on his way to the Church of St. James in Tlatelolco for his weekly catechetical instruction. He passed by Tepeyac Hill, where once had stood a temple to the Aztec mother goddess Tonatzin. According to the Nikan Mopua, uh, which is the, the Nahuatl account of the story of Juan Diego, it's the native account of the story of Juan Diego, it's the first two words, here it is told. Juan Diego heard celestial music from the top of the hill. Climbing the hill to investigate, he beheld a beautiful woman arrayed in white light. He fell to his knees. My son, where are you going? Noble lady, I am on my way to the church in Tlatelolco. And then the lady said, You must know and be very certain in your heart, my son, that I am truly the perpetual and perfect Virgin Mary, Holy Mother of the true God through whom everything lives, the creator and master of heaven and earth. I wish and intensely desire that in this place my sanctuary be erected so that in it I may show and make known and give all my love, my compassion, my help, and my protection to the people. I am your merciful mother, the mother of all of you who live united in this land, all of you. Spanish, Mexican. All of you who love me, of those who cry to me, of those who seek me, of those who have confidence in me, here I will hear their weeping, their sorrow, and will remedy and alleviate their suffering, necessities, and misfortunes. And so that my intentions may be made known, you must go to the house of the Bishop of Mexico and tell him that I sent you and that it is my desire to have a sanctuary built there. Juan Diego went and saw the bishop, and who can hardly be blamed for his skepticism. Zumarga told him to come back. The Indian returned to the hill at sunset and said to the lady, I am only a poor man. I am not worthy of being there where you send me. Pardon me, my queen. I do not want to make your noble heart sad. I do not want to fall into your displeasure. The lady assured him that he was her chosen one. After Mass the following day, he returned to the bishop, who this time questioned Juan Diego, who this time questioned Juan Diego about some details and listened with more interest. Ask the lady for some proof that she is the mother of God, the bishop said. When he returned to the hill, the beautiful lady assured him that he would have his sign. Returning to his uncle, That evening, Juan Diego learned that Juan Bernardino had grown more ill. 
all day the following day, Monday, December 11th, Juan Diego cares for his uncle. Juan Bernardino thinks he's going to die, and he asks Juan Diego to find him a priest. On Tuesday, December 12th, he set out for one, but he avoids Tepeyac Hill because he doesn't want to run into the beautiful lady because he's broken his promise. But she comes down the hill and finds him, like she does for all of us. She asks him, where are you going? He said he was seeking a priest for his uncle. And she said to him, listen and be sure, my dear son, that I will protect you. Do not be frightened or grieve or let your heart be dismayed. However great the illness may be that you speak of, am I not here? I, who am your mother, and is not my help a refuge? Am I not your kind? Do not be concerned about your uncle's illness, for he is not going to die. Be assured he is already well. Is there anything else you need? (laughs) But what does she say here? Am I not of your kind? She told Juan Diego to climb down the hill and gather the flowers. Oh, so she, yeah, so she tells Juan Diego to go up the hill, right, where, where there will be flowers. So she climbs up the hill and gathers the flowers that he would find there and bring them back to her. And this he did. And many flowers of various varieties, including Castilian roses, all blooming in a rocky and fertile space in the middle of, of winter, right, frosty December. He gathered the flowers in his tilma, you know, a big smock, and brings them back to Our Lady. And I, this is the most touching part of the story to me. She, he hands the flowers to Our Lady, and then she arranges them for him in his tilma. And you can, Warren Carroll has a beautiful image in his book, and he says, you can imagine a mother just kind of fixing up her son before he, you know, in his Sunday clothes, you know, straightening his tie and fixing his buttons before he goes to Mass. Our Lady takes the flowers and arranges them in the tilma. It's a tender act of motherhood. He rushes to the bishop whose guards try to take the flowers, but when they reach in, then they just appear as images on his tilma. At last, they allow him to see the bishop. He opens up his tilma. The flowers fall to the ground, and that that would have been miracle enough, right? But the true marvel there in the tilma, the brilliant image of our Blessed Mother, the bishop and his attendants fall to their knees. On rising, they fought, went immediately with Juan Diego to the top of Tepeyac Hill. Juan Diego showed them where to build the chapel. Returning to his uncle, he learned that the lady had appeared to Juan Bernardino and that he was cured. And significantly, that she revealed her name, not to Juan Diego, but to his uncle, Juan Bernardino, because he was older. And this is important to the native people. Right? She reveals her names to Juan Bernardino, the perfect virgin of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Within two weeks, the chapel was built. Pilgrims and more pilgrims came to venerate the image and discover the abundant glyphs on the image which the Aztec people understood, the various flowers, all known that, that, that the Aztecs would have recognized from all of their codices. Within fewer than 20 years, 9 million baptisms. By comparison, the Spanish took 200 years to convert the Philippines. What followed was three centuries of the flourishing of the most Catholic nation in the history of this hemisphere. Mexico's revolutions, like all the revolutions in the West, beginning with 1789 in Paris, all the way to the revolution of the contraceptive pill in mid-century America, have cast this nation back into a darkness of a bizarre cocktail of superstition and unbelief. But like a beacon, the tilma continues to radiate and reveal more and more secrets. Ignatius Press just came out with this book. It's, it's, It's originally a Polish publisher called Rosicon Press. And it's, it's a beautiful coffee table book. It'd make a magnificent um, Christmas present. Uh, but but I, I, I highly recommend it to you. And I, I mention it also because I, I ripped off a lot of images from the book here. And so I, I, Father Fessio told me that if I didn't say that, that he would sue me. And what's 
<laughs> it's, it's, on, it's on there. It's on your thing. It's called um, uh, Guadalupe Mysteries Deciphering the Code. So very quickly, and I'm not an expert on the Telm at all, but I'm an amateur historian. I'm a student of history. But we'll, I'll go through these really quickly. So the thing should have decayed a long time ago. It's, it's made out of agave, agave fibers. There's a reason the Mexicans don't use agave fibers anymore. It, it falls apart. And they did some tests where they made another Tillman, painted an image on it, and exposed it. You know, the thing was in this chapel for, for decades and decades and decades before it was, uh, uh, centuries, before it was put in a more suitable location, a larger church was built, right, in the 1700s. And so it was exposed to all the, all the conditions of climate, saltpeter in the air. There's no, there's no way that something made of agave fibers would have survived. All right, so it should have fallen apart a long time ago. So the durability of the thing. There's no evidence of paint. So infrared images uh, find no evidence of paint. And interestingly, if it were a painting, there would be, there would be a sketch underneath it, right? A cartoon uh, that, that, then, that the artist would then paint over. So not only do, do we not locate any brush strokes with the image, but there's no evidence of a, of a, of a cartoon underneath, Right? You all know the constellations align up with the way the constellations were on that morning at 635 in the morning at the moment in 1531. Right? I think that's probably the best thing. But I don't know if you know this. Um, those constellations also provide a musical score. And uh, you can find it online. It's beautiful. And this is, I think, significant because Juan Diego's account uh, is that he hear, first he hears music. First he hears music. Um, this I didn't know until very recently. If she's laid across, horizontally across Mexico, uh, the, the, the largest of the glyphs, the largest of the flowers on her, um, on her gown uh, correspond with the principal volcanoes of Mexico. Um, this is like 92%, 92% accuracy here. Uh, there's a, and I'm not a geometer. Don't ask me to explain this, but geometers have determined that the, the thing is, all, all the angles inside of it are perfect. There's one thing to note, that the, the tilt of her head is the tilt of the axis of the earth. It's the same angle as the axis of the earth. Yeah. And then, of course, the eyes. Um, you're all familiar with this. I think there's something like 13 persons reflected in the eyes, enlargements of the eyes. So our lady was present in the room when Juan Diego, not seen, but present in the room when Juan Diego is revealing the tilma to uh, the bishop. And then that's the scene that's reflected in, in the eyes. Uh, but also, with respect to the eyes, they've made some other, ophthalmologists have made some other, two other discoveries. The, the vision is three-dimensional. So the way that humans have three-dimensional vision, right? And so the way that image appears is three-dimensional. And then there's this other thing called the uh, Perkine, or Perkine Sanson effect, uh, where one of the images there in the iris is going to be, is going to be inverted. And you can find this effect in a, in a, um, in a natural human eye. So that's a few of the, those real quick, because I know we're, we're running out of time. It's something, uh, I think I mentioned the Francis Johnston book, which is quite good on there. She, she observes in there that it's something that a world that is so dedicated to science and scientific discovery, it, it just ref- refuses to acknowledge the superabundance of unaccountable phenomenon verified by scientific inquiry on, on the Tilma. All right, here's a little epilogue. In March of 2009, the American Secretary of State visited Mexico City and made a fitting display of diplomatic courtesy by placing flowers before Our Lady of Guadalupe. Allowed a proximity to say nothing of time with the image of which the daily Mexican pilgrim might, of which the daily Mexican pilgrim might only dream, the Secretary of State turned to the cathedral's rector and said, who painted it? What Hillary Clinton thought when the rector responded, God painted it, we do not know. But we do know that immediately following her time with the sacred tilma, she was on a plane to Houston 
to accept Planned Parenthood's highest award, named for its founder, Margaret Sanger. So to me, it's astonishing, or should be anyway, that a people, the Mexican people, so devoted to the Virgin of Guadalupe, the only Mary, oh, by the way, the only Mary in apparition in which she appears pregnant, and the evidence for this is the, 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 the belt there, and the Spanish word, I think is encita. Encita, right, which means you know, pregnant, right? But it, it refers to, you know, tied up in that belt, right? It is astonishing to me that a people so devoted to the Virgin of Guadalupe, the only Marian apparition, to my knowledge, in which she appears pregnant, are also so determined if the, uh, well, we had the vote, in their support of a presidential candidate who could not have been more explicit on national TV about her unwavering support for the taking of innocent unborn life. Indeed, within, within a day of delivery. She said it on television. You all saw it. It was, it was astounding. And I've never seen a Democrat be that candid. But I am hopeful to believe that Our Lady, who vanquished so much human sacrifice in this hemisphere half a century ago, is ready to do it again. She has the cooperation... She had the cooperation of courageous but flawed men, like Hernan Cortez. All of us here have the flawed part down. (laughs) Myself, chief among them. The question is, do we have the courage? I think we start with this. The example of Juan Diego, he said yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Hopefully it will all help us prepare for the feast day coming at, uh, later this week. All right. So for question and answer, who's first? I had heard or read, I don't remember, that uh, it was easy for the, uh, I guess, the Aztecs to convert because of a bloody king, which Jesus was, gave his life, was, I guess, familiar to them because of all the blood and stuff. It, is there any truth to that? Okay, so the, the prophecy that Quetzalcoatl, and I don't know that I'm... Pre- but, but who's going who, to say it? Who knows it? Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. Yeah. Quetzalcoatl. Uh, uh, I, I was talking to my friend Jim Vogel, who uh, runs Angeles Press, and I said, I'm, I'm giving a talk on Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I don't know how to say all these Nahuatl words. And he says, that's okay, nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, apparently that's not true. <laughs> so, ke- so, oh, very good. So that guy. Um, so, uh, it, it's it's interesting. There, the, uh, there, there was even a Mormon. Uh, one of the, one of the one of the, who's like the head of the Mormons. The the the. the ch- no, 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 no. But the, the current guy. What do they call him? The, 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 the prophet, right? Yeah, or whatever. Um, so uh, one in one of them in the in the 19th century. There's a quote from him where they're claiming him too as kind of a Christ-like figure. Uh, so, and then there's there's other things that he came from Venus, and there's other accounts that he came from Wales, the country next to England. So. Um, uh, yeah, but but there there are things in Aztec mythology, and the important thing, as far as I understand the story, is that the date that Cortez arrives corresponds with the date of the prophecy. Quetzalcoatl was uh, was opposed to human sacrifice in some versions of the Aztec mythology. Uh, and so, uh, and, 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 that, and that, you know, adds to the element of the story. I think it is, so I don't really know the answer to the question, but it seems to be true that Montezuma's capitulation derived not just in part, not, not only because of the, the evidence of Spanish strength and the allies that, you know, hundreds of thousands, that uh, Cortez assembled, but because of this prophecy was, but beyond that, I'm a complete amateur on the topic, like I am going to be on your question or, or, or yours. 
Well, I have heard, I'm, I'm Mexican, was born a few miles from, from the apparition place, yeah, so I, I feel very uh, well, strongly see, about it. this woman should yeah. have given a talk. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 we, yeah, we have given that talk in Spanish. But I've heard that uh, behind, underneath the, 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 how do you call it, the, the, the seed, seed duck, uh, they can hear the, the beats of a baby. That actually is not true. It's not true. Okay. Yeah. And in, uh, so, I, I was doubting. That's what was yeah, saying. and in fact, so, um, so this man, Monsignor Eduardo Chavez, who wrote this book along with Carl Anderson, who's the king of the Knights of Columbus, or what, what do they call him? Grand. <laughs> grand Knight. Grand, I'm sorry. I know there's knights in the room. I'm making friends. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a great book. And, 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 there, and there's a, there's a, a, a translation of, of the Nikan Mapula in here, but Chavez has a, excuse me yeah Chavez has a, an excellent website where he says yes this is in fact true no this is a myth and the heartbeat that's a myth yeah so and I trust him he's the leading authority on Guadalupean studies I mean actually you know Father Hezekiah should have had him come give his talk. So could you please just um, reiterate what you said about the eyes of the uh, image? So would they look under a microscope and see different images within the eyes of the image? Uh, Okay, so insofar as I understand this, which is exceedingly limited... Um, and, that, and that's why you should buy this book, actually, because in here you can get a much clearer depiction of what's going on and an and, and explanation of what's been done. But uh, it, it, it's not with a microscope. In fact, what they've done is digitally enlarged yeah. the eyes and the iris they measure is five sixteenths of an inch. Um, so they digitally enlarge the eyes and then they are able to. I mean, on this picture, I know. This is what the skeptics say. It just looks like, you know, muddy things or whatever. But even then, how would an artist do that in such a small space, right? But, yeah, so in the image, ophthalmologists have determined that there's a three-dimensional, that is, a a a three-dimensional view of 13 people in the room, including Juan Diego and Bishop... Zumarga, and also a family, interestingly enough. And um, Chavez makes much of that in here, the presence of the family. There's a woman with a baby on her, carrying a baby on her back in, in, in that image as well. But it's digital enlargements. It's not microscopic examination. So, but uh, all this really, a little bit of time in front of the uh, search engine, you can, you can see pretty high-resolution images of it. But I, 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 I can't overstate the value of this. Some of the history... Father Fascio, you're not listening. Some of the history in the front of the book is... N- it's a couple things. But you should still buy it. Um, Mr. Sek, I was just wondering, what do you mean by the conquest of darkness? How can you refer this to the Indians of Mexico and Catholic Spain? I don't, I don't understand what that means. Okay, so say the question again, the conquest of the, darkness. What, the title, conquest of darkness, what does that refer to? Well, darkness in this case refers to the fact that the people of, of Mexico or Mexica uh, were, in sla- were, were, were under the bondage of really worship of the devil uh, and his um, various demons, uh, and that this worship manifested itself in, uh, uh, in full-scale human sacrifice that we don't see anywhere else in human history. That's pretty dark. Yeah, very dark. What is Tilma again? Is Tilma the entirety, or is Tilma the wraparound? Is Tilma the apparition? Tilma is a garment. A tilma is a garment, and in fact, uh, there's even a picture in here um, of, of what a tilma is. But a tilma is a garment, and by the way, there are so many different things to talk about here. Different way, the, the tilma is like a smock or, a, or, a, or almost like a, like a toga. 
you know, although a toga has a political meaning in ancient Rome, a, a, a specific political meaning. Uh, well, you, you know how, um, like, like, like doctors or interns, the interns get to wear this, and then what do you call somebody who's not an intern but not quite, a, whatever. And, yeah, yeah and, then, and, then, and then like the guy here, he gets to wear this, right? So different ways that the tilma was wrapped and worn indicated social strata in the society. Um, but the tilma is a, is a garment worn, and also it, it's, it's a utility garment. So mothers would carry their babies in the thing. You know, we see things like this kind of today and those things that, the, what do you call it? Yeah, or the things that the, that the La Leche enthusiasts... Um, Baby carrier. Yeah, they sort of think... Well, no, I'm for La Leche, that's fine. Yeah, but... Um, I'm, I'm pro breast milk, yeah, but it, it, it's a it's a garment. It's it's a garment, and so he, it was the thing that he was wearing, and now it's behind a piece of glass in Mexico City, yeah. The part that you were saying was painted or not painted. That did not involve the tilma at all. Okay, so well, I'm trying to think. Hillary. Oh, Hillary asked who painted it. By the way, whoever was supposed to brief her, <laughs> I hope that person lost his or her job. Because she, she just didn't know the story. I mean, it's, look, there are plenty of things to object to about Hillary Clinton. She, was, she just didn't. I, it, it, frankly, I don't know how anybody can not know the story. It's called cluelessness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very, yeah, yeah. But she asked who painted it. Now, by the way, this is interesting. There are there are some there is some evidence of painting on the down tilma, at the yeah. At the, you're absolutely right. At, at, down at the bottom, so um, the, the, the moon especially is now darkened and somewhat larger probably than it was originally, and so there's some evidence of, of painting there and uh, uh, the angel. Um, so in the I, I, the tape's not running, is it? Because I don't actually know. But in the 18th century, uh, yeah, they, you know, they just kind of wanted to doll it up a little bit. And so, but none of that, none of that negates the miraculous things that we talked about. I have heard when I was down at Guadalupe, I have heard that indeed to have 80,000 people killed on a frequent basis, there weren't that many people within the country, and it is a number that is greatly exaggerated. Do you think that that makes sense, to uh, well, think well, the numbers are exaggerated? Yeah, so c- certainly, certainly there are historians who argue that, and what we have is the testimony of the Spaniards from the 16th century, principally, and so is it within the realm of belief that they may have exaggerated the figures? But the case of the... Uh, this particular event in, in 1487 comes from native uh, sources through the Spanish, so possibly, you know, doctored, exaggerated. Um, what we do know is that the population of the region did decline during the Aztec rule, as we might expect it to do. We do also know that the Aztecs had laws that a certain number per village or city had to be sacrificed a year. And when you think that there are there were something like 370 or 375 villages, city-states, towns subjected to Aztec rule, and then you do this math, then you, you can come up with about 50,000 a year fairly easily. Um, one of the things that the archaeologists object to is the lack of the well, I won't say the, the, I won't say the lack, but what they regard as a scarcity of archaeological evidence as far as things like skulls and that sort of thing. But I mean, there can be some decay there as well. Let's say it's half the number. It's still horrifying. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr. Check. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7150.
855. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.